Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. And this morning we will commence in our study, Philippians 2 and verse 12. And we will uh, look at verse 12 and verse 13. And boy, is this a controversial portion of Scripture. It ought not to be. Uh, It shouldn't be. Unfortunately, it has been very poorly taught in many denominational circles. And uh, there's just no way for you to come to the conclusion other than what the Bible says here in totality. But there have been those, listen church, there have been those who have used this portion of scripture to manipulate people. That's a tragic thing. So I want all of you to be keen students of the Bible this morning. The title of the message is this, it's time to go now. It's time to go. The apostle would say to go now, and that is to leave off from what we now know, from what we've been instructed, and to go on further into our Christian life. This is going to be great discipleship stuff in these next couple of weeks. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 12, we'll look down to verse 13 this morning. Therefore, you ought to circle the word therefore, we'll tell you why in a moment, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Tremendous statement. There's almost nothing in Christianity that is private. Now let me explain that. There's almost nothing within Christianity that is private. When I say almost, I mean there are things, obviously, when you and I pray, we often pray privately. Nobody sees that. Uh, That's commendable. That's what the Bible talks about. So that's kind of in secret, right? There are things, maybe you and I might worship God in secret, but we certainly do pray publicly, don't we? We certainly uh, worship publicly as a people. Uh, There are some things where, again, very, very few, short list that is private to to the Christian and his Christianity. Outside of that, I think you'll agree when you read the Bible that Christianity is a very, very outspoken, public, very aware type of faith. It cannot sit on the sidelines. It doesn't sit on the sidelines. And The apostle is going to be talking to us about that. It's very public. It's very global. It's very much of an experience. And I want you to remember that as we go through this, that Christianity is an actual experience. I need to be careful in saying that, but but it is accurate. It's accurate because the God who is the creator is an active God. His creation's active. You are active. Faith is active. Look, the Bible says God is love. It's a verb. Love is active. Experience that. But on the flip side, I want to issue this little bit of a warning. There are people who say there is no such thing as Christianity unless you're going through some sort of an experience, unless you have goosebumps and you're running around barking and laughing and going crazy. Oh, we need to experience God. That's not what the Bible teaches. This experience is the possessiveness of God in your life. We're going to be learning about that. It's what Paul is teaching them. We have just come from this high and lofty declaration of the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord in verses 5 through 11. And with that reality, God expects us now to not be neutral. He doesn't expect us to be somewhat unplugged. When we announced last week as we stood and, and uh, made it very clear that Jesus Christ is Lord, it was, it's either true or false in your life. But in, eventually, uh, in some moment, some grand moment, all of those that are in heaven, those that are on earth, the Bible says, and all those under the earth that is in the spiritual realm will one day bow as you've learned and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But now he focuses, Paul is, he focuses his attention on us now who are living here and now. And he's saying to us, now that you know all that, that Jesus Christ is the Lord and you do bow your knee to him because he's speaking to believers, look in your Bible, he calls them beloved. This is to the Christian. So Paul as it were, by the Holy Spirit is speaking to us this morning right here, that what we know regarding the high and lofty things of Jesus should affect us here and now on this earth. That's Christianity. In fact, someone as wisely says, there is no value to a mountaintop experience unless it helps us to live in the valleys of life. Isn't that a good line? I like that. 
I think that's great. So now Paul takes our heads, as it were, out of the clouds, and he brings us down into the mode of doing Christianity. And it all comes down to what a real Christian is. What do we look like if we're for real? What do we sound like if we are, in fact, for real? And what do we do as Christians? So point number one this morning is this. It's time to go now. He would say in verse 12, further on, Christian, further on in your walk with God, further on. This is the charge of the disciple. This is the charge of the growing Christian to go further on. He says in verse 12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, this is a great statement, but now much more in my absence. Mark this down, if you would, in verse 12, that Moving forward on in our Christian walk with God, it would mean this, that we are to now walk like you know it. Walk like you know it. Can you write that down? If I'm a Christian, I'm to walk like I know that. I'm to do this thing. What do we mean by that? I asked you a moment ago to circle the word therefore in verse 12. And for this reason, by the way, some of your translations, you may have a more modern translation of the Bible. Uh, I think the old, does the old King James, if anybody has it out there, does the old King James say wherefore? I think it does. New King James says therefore. Uh, Some of the newer translations might say because of. All of those are excellent. All of those are perfect. It's all of that. Wherefore, therefore, because, what? Because he's announcing, my beloved, because of everything you've just learned, Because of these glorious revelations of Jesus, how does that affect the believer? Do we just go and sit on a rock and meditate and say, Jesus is Lord? Listen, many, many years ago, tragically, it's been nearly two millennia ago, someone uh, got the idea that they were so spiritual and the world so corrupt that for them to be really, really a devout Christian they would uh, mount up onto some hill or precipice or truly go to a mountaintop and build a monastery. I'm not joking. I'm not making light of it. Really. Let's build a community away from the world because they recognize the world is sin-filled. We love God. So the only reasonable thing to do is to separate our relationship from the world and hang out with God on the mountain. Did you know that Christianity teaches the opposite? The complete opposite. That's not in the Bible. Well, you know, we are of the group. Oh, you're in the wrong group. Oh, we are the super special, super dupers. You know what? Come down from your monastery. Stop monkeying around. (laughs) Did you get that? I know it's early, but. And get among the lost humanity. Christianity is so resilient. It is so strong. Listen, we are to go out into the world and to shine the light and the love of God. And listen, that does not damage, hurt, or offend your Christianity. It's the exact opposite. Because Jesus is Lord. We are ready to go out into the world and we say, hey, you know what? Guess what? Friends on Skid Row, you guys over there in that, that you know, the pimp regarding the prostitutes, uh, the drug addicts, the arrogant man with the corner office, uh, the guy mowing the lawn or the man taking out the train. It doesn't matter. We go everywhere. And, and listen, your Christianity cannot get dirty. You are lights and shining armor. It bounces right off of you. You are a believer. We are to be infused into the world. This world hurts. This world's scared. This world stinks. That's why we're supposed to get into it. To separate from it. I don't think so. No, we're taught in the Bible. We're to move on. And the more, listen, the more we're equipped to get on out into the world and shine the light of Christ, let me tell you what happens. Boy, the more dependent you're upon God. And one of the great things is as you walk, you'll walk like you know that. You will know this. God is at work in my life. Now, if God is telling you not to go somewhere, listen, if you have a problem uh, having been delivered from alcoholism and drinking and stuff, and you're saying, gosh, I guess, God, I guess Jack is telling me that the Lord's telling me that I need to go down to Joe's Bar and Grill and preach Christ. No, listen, if that's a temptation, don't go there. Go, uh, go somewhere else, but not there. Okay, if you have a problem with witnessing to 
uh, people of a certain group or a certain lifestyle or a certain belief, then listen, don't go there. That's for somebody else to go. Don't go stumble somewhere. Be strong in the Lord, but listen, God will show you, and most often, it's the very people right in front of us at work or in the family or in the neighborhood. It's very important. But walk like you know it. Know what? Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why the therefore is right here in our Bibles. And again, he calls them beloved. Brothers and sisters, a tremendous statement that we are already believers. You're going to need to mark that down because, listen, some of you, because look, this is Calvary Chapel. There are people here from every walk of spiritual life here. Do you know that? And it's inevitable that I'm going to come to someone who has been taught differently regarding these two verses of Scripture, and your life has been miserable because of it. And I'll begin to expose that right now. When he says to us right here, that my beloved, as you have always obeyed, this is not Paul inviting. This is not some church leader saying, you obey us no matter what we tell you. That's not what Paul is saying. So number one, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, the lords over the people, are condemned in Scripture. Paul is not saying, obey us apostles in everything, and you don't, you don't need to do anything. You don't even need to talk to God. You just listen to us. That's wrong. If there's some pastor, priest, or uh, evangelist, or pope telling you, you've got to do this. I don't care what the Bible says, or you got it all right. You do what I say. Listen, you're going to see in this chapter that Paul is going to be announcing, you do what I'm teaching you if it's biblical and you can align it up with Scripture. Because look, I am supposed to be an example to you. That's terrifying. You might say, well, who, 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 who made you? A... I didn't, do... listen, I didn't ask for this. And it's terrifying. You and I live with each other. We eat together. You know what I mean? We live, I live, we, I live in your neighborhood. We, eat, we shop at the same stores. We eat at the same restaurants. We see each other. That's by design. And I'm supposed to be an example. Paul is saying, and he's going to show us that he's been an example to the Philippian believers. But watch what he announces here shortly. It's very powerful. As we come to that, he's going to ask. He's going to be instructing them to walk like they know that Jesus Christ, not Paul, is in fact their Lord. And because we know that, we walk differently. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. He's talking about the cross. To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. That's who he's talking about. Paul is talking about Christians in Philippi. You see, Jack, why do you keep harping on this? Because some churches have taught he's not talking to Christians. He's talking to people who have to become Christians by their works. And that's a very flesh-appealing invitation, but it's completely dangerous. The second thing we see right here is that we are to walk like you mean it. We are not only to walk like what we know. We know, we know. How many of you know John 3.16? Just raise your hand. I need to show your hands. John 3.16. Listen, Satan knows John 3.16. Every every person that's ever attended a sporting event knows John 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16. So the challenge to us is, Paul would say, then then live like it. Live like, okay, you know that, so, so live like that. The next thing that he would say to us is that when you live like that, mean it. In other words, live your Christianity with a very, very strong, predetermined action. So, am I a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. Then I'm to live like that. I'm to go live like that in such a way that I mean it. That Christianity, is this true? That Christianity for you is the most important thing in your life. If you get down to the nuts and bolts of it all, it actually isn't your income, is it? That's going to evaporate someday. It will not last no matter what. What about your health? It's not going to last What about time? The young people, you know, for young people, time just drags. Do you remember that when you were young? It's like, when is this school year ever going to end? 
Did you notice how long the school year was? And how, how long did, you, did the summer break feel? Yeah, a yeah, day. It's like, oh boy, oh what? <laughs> as you get older, though, have you noticed as you get older, it just all melts into a very fast-paced understanding that time is fleeting. We don't have time. That's why the message is this. It's time to go now. It's time for us to be believers now. It's time for us to get engaged now. It's time for us to obey Jesus now. Because time's running out, and he's worthy. Remember, verse 9 taught us last time that he's the one that's been highly exalted. Verse 11 tells us that he is the Lord. And so now we come to verse 12, and we are to live and to love and to act and to be like we mean it. Because we know it. He says there in verse 12, as you have always obeyed. What a tremendous witness. This church, Paul, is so encouraging. He says, you've always obeyed. See, what does this mean? What does this mean to obey? Here's what the word means. It's a very cool word. Are you ready, everybody? You're quiet. Are you, are you with me? Okay. So here's what the word means, to obey. It means to bring your ear under the mouth of someone speaking. That's what it means in the Greek. Isn't it amazing? I love that. Look, bring your ear under the mouth of the one who's speaking. In fact, you're going to recognize this in a moment. It means to bring your mouth or your ear under the mouth of the one that's speaking. It means to hear from underneath. It means to listen with a focused and attentive, is the word, focus. I'm a tune. Listen, we get this saying from it. Listen to every word that falls from his lips or mouth, right? That's exactly the meaning of the Greek word. He says, as you have obeyed, wow. You know what Paul is saying? Paul said, I gave you the word of God, and you took it in like this. You couldn't get enough. You were like little birds with your mouths wide open. As the truth was being dropped in, you're going, yes, yes, yes. Boy, that's something. Listen, do I listen like that? You guys, um, now she's not here right now, so I can, I can say this. Lisa won't be here until second service, but... Sometimes, because just because I am the way that I am, and I'm not asking her to excuse it, I'm asking her to help me get over it. Um, things will be going, what's happening, you know, whatever's going on and stuff. And, and when, if it's really important, she has to treat me like a five year old. I'm not saying that's her fault, I'm saying it's my fault. What she has to do, she has to come up to me right now, she'll put her hands on my shoulders and she'll say, This is what I'm telling you. I need you to get. A carton of eggs or whatever it is, and you do nod your head, Jack, if you can hear me. <laughs> so you pray for her, because she has to live with this. Okay? But I'm telling you the truth right now. You can ask her later. That's what that's what the apostle is saying. You guys have listened to me give you the word of God. Not if you understand what I'm saying to you. And they would have been, yeah, yeah, we've listened to every word. We've put our ear under your mouth, Paul. And I'm convicted by that. Every single time to God be the glory for his faithfulness and mercy that when he speaks to me, I'm not always listening. I'm convinced of this now. Every time I determine to listen from God, I hear him. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, 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 please. When I don't hear from God, it's not because God's not speaking. I'm not listening. And when I sense that he's grabbing me by the shoulders and he says, Jack, are you listening to me? When I do, you guys, my life is so directed. It is so blessed. It is so clear what I'm supposed to do. I love it. I don't even have, I don't, many times I don't agree with it though. I mean, have you ever had that with God? God will tell you something to do. It's like, I don't agree with that. And he says, I'm not asking you to agree. Well, I think we should do this. Well, God will say, I'm not doing it. You want to go left? Go left, Jack, but I'm not going left. And it's like, mm. all right. And you have to decide. 
And every time you decide to listen to him and obey, see, did you hear the word? It's obey. Bring your ear under the mouth of, what does that imply? It implies that we are disobedient people. Think of it. He tells them, you guys are awesome. You've always obeyed. Listen, we are prone to disobedience. Even as Christians, don't look at me like that. As Christians, we're prone to disobedience. And you know it's true whenever we think or say, well, I feel like I'm going to. Oh, you know, I know it's not in the Bible, but I think God wants me to. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Watch out. No, listen. Put your ear under the mouth of the words that are coming out of God's heart. And listen, you determine to obey and watch what happens to your life. Amazing blessings. Hey, can I say this? 100% true. Obedience is liberty. Absolute liberty and freedom. Walk like that with him, to obey him. And Paul says something profound. And uh, this is a, a parent pushing, as it were, a child out of the nest. Not as in my presence only. Okay, you guys, you guys obeyed very well. Listen to every word falling from my mouth when I was with you guys. But now that I'm gone, guess what? Obey much more now in my absence. What's he saying? Look, you, you guys did great on your training wheels in front of me. I'm leaving. I'm gone. Take the training wheels off because guess what? You don't have Paul with you anymore because you don't need Paul with you anymore. Who do they have with them? You've got Jesus with you. You've got the Lord with you. You need not training wheels anymore. You've got the Lord. Oh, listen, do we have a tendency to go back to, oh, hi, mom, dad, I don't know what to do about this or that, you know? And after, you know, it's time by now being 43 years of age, you ought to just get on your knees and ask God. I don't know what to do. Are you a Christian? Yes, pray. He will tell you. He'll show you. How is he going to do that? He'll often speak right out of his Bible. You mean I got to read it? <laughs> you want to hear from him, don't you? Read his word, he speaks. Put your ear under his mouth and he'll speak. And it will fall right out into your ear. Awesome. It's not a mystery to follow God. We make it difficult. We make it hard. And we, by the way, are you like me? We're all in this together. We always analyze everything to death. God says, do this. But how? Just do it. Why? Just do it. <laughs> right? Can you show me the schematic on that? <laughs> and can you put it like in 3D? And God just goes, he's just like this. By the way, he normally, he normally says things once, sometimes twice. After that, if you notice, he goes like this. Go, Jack. <laughs> Go, Jack. <laughs> and then he goes like this. That's what he does to me. And then I get tired of yakking and whining. And then I wind up going anyway, and I waste half a day. <laughs> it's kind of like you're in battle, and you say, Doc! And somebody, says, somebody stands up and says, oh, why? <laughs> you know, you, not, not a good move. Better to obey and then ask questions later, <laughs> right? Quick, put on your seatbelt. Oh, uh -huh, who says? <laughs> Just obey him. He's good for you. 1 Corinthians 4.15 says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, teachers, yet you do not have many fathers, those who have brought you to Christ. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, therefore I urge you, imitate me. This is huge. You say, Jack, I, just, I thought you just said for Paul not to... No, no. He says, imitate me? Listen, imitate. We have get the word mimic. You know a mime? You know those, those funny street people, the mime? A mime that does the weird thing, that's exactly the word right here in the Greek, is do what I do. Wow, that's a huge statement. That meant that Paul was so walking with Jesus that he was not afraid to tell the Corinthians or the Philippians, you watch me and you do that. Ladies and gentlemen, Christians, we ought to be able to say that every one of us, we should be able to go back to the campus tomorrow at school and say, you guys, listen, you want to follow Jesus? Yeah. Yeah then do exactly as I show you to do. Do exactly as you watch me. You watch me, do the same thing. That's how we're supposed to live. That is awesome, dynamic Christianity, you guys. That changed the world forever. It did change the world forever. 
Walk like you mean it. Christianity is the brotherhood of one, shared by all. Jesus is our brother. Amen? It's one with him. We are one with him. And what Jesus says and does, we're, we're supposed to do and say what Jesus says and does. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us. Now, that verse, Ephesians 5, 1, I had that interestingly brought to my attention yesterday in the reverse. I guess, let me explain for a moment first. When he says in Ephesians 5, 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Children. Follow God like children. Have you noticed children, um, little boys, have you noticed little boys will, will find their dad's work gloves, the yard gloves or something, and they'll put them on? You ever seen how funny they look? They got a, their arms are like this long, and the gloves are like that big. And, and the, the boy, the, 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 the little guy will get his dad's hammer and walk around and start pounding stuff. Inevitably, you'll see, you'll hear her before you see her. You hear clickety clacking coming down the hallway of your three year old with high heels on and mommy's dress somewhere in the distance behind her, right? Following. And she's. It's from the heart, and God loves it. Paul told the Ephesians, follow God with a child's heart, like a child does. And yesterday, my granddaughter and I, we were taking a walk around the block, and you know it's springtime, and those dastardly, devilish, terrible dandelions <laughs> are popping up in your yard. And everybody loves that little, you know, the little ball that you blow and the seeds. Uh, yeah, the, us gardeners are like, Get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, those things are like death to your yard. But little kids love to blow them. And they go in a million directions into your yard. Um, but you know, there's the flower, the little yellow blossom. Nobody, nobody collects those, right, as a bouquet. You don't go to, you don't go to uh, I don't know where, you don't go to the flower shop and you, I'd like to have some, a bouquet of dandelion, please. Well, dandelion boogie. No, you don't. But you know what? My, my granddaughter picks one. Actually, Donna and Brent, it was from your yard. <laughs> We're out in front of your house, and she picks three of them. And she says, Papa, this one's for you. This is for Mimi, and this is for Mommy. Her dad was at, at the firehouse, so he didn't get one. <laughs> so we go home, and time goes on, and now she's gone home. And I'm in the backyard, and I see the dandelion laying on the, in the patio. And without even thinking, I picked it up, and I brought it in the house, and I put it in a, in a bowl, a cup of water, to, you know, to save it. Well, why would you save a dandelion flower? For only one reason. It didn't even dawn on me at that moment it was dandelion. It was from my granddaughter. And I looked at it, and, I, and here's the true story. I looked at that, and I said, what? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> and the Lord, like a lightning bolt, just deposited this in my heart. Jack, that's exactly what I do with your worship and your service to me. The world might hate it. The world might think it's trouble. It may be despised and people would like to spray killer on it. <laughs> but what you bring to me, I love it. And I'm going to put it, and it was very funny. You know what? I'll put it on Facebook or something because I took a picture of it with my phone. And it dawned on me. And I had it in one of Lisa's crystal bowls. So it's all faceted with these crystals. I don't know if she appreciated it or not. But it's like, oh my goodness. Here's a dandelion floating in water surrounded by crystal. And the Lord said, that's, that's you and me, Jack. That's us. You're, you know, my kids are despised in this world. But I love you guys. And because it came out of my granddaughter's heart, it's like, honestly, it's the greatest flower or bouquet I've ever seen. It's the best I've ever seen. 
Conroy's or whoever can't make it any better than that. It's awesome. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Translation, follow me only if I am following Jesus. Exhortation, don't follow spiritual leaders if you see non-Jesus attributes in their life. Well, you know, my pastor's cool, but he gets drunk a lot. <laughs> Time to leave. Well, my pastor is a great Bible teacher, but he's got this problem, and it's, leave. You see what I'm saying? We should be in this thing together following Jesus, and God establishes leaders. This church has got tons of leaders all over the place in all kinds of ministries. You are to follow them, mimic, not look, look at me, are you looking at me? Don't follow like this. Oh. <laughs> Whatever you say, jump off the cliff. Okay. Look, the world's full of that insanity. When you see them walking with Jesus, following Jesus, then you do that too. And by the way, I love the accountability that God places in the heart of a real leader. The fear of 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 should terrify every true believer, every true follower. We are living in a way that others will copy. Have you noticed that a church becomes, or a fellowship, or a group becomes like its leaders? That's a fact. It's a fact. Good, bad, or ugly, it's a fact. It's amazing. The next thing, you guys, in verse 12, at the latter end of verse 12, is this. It's time to go on now, further on in our walk with God, and we're to walk like you do it. I know that's not great grammar, but walk like you do it. See, what does that mean? It's kind of a weird statement. I know. But you know what? How God wants you and I to walk. When I say walk, it's live. When God wants us to walk, he's got that in a package. He's got that in an envelope. So it's a, it's a foregone conclusion given to us by God what we're supposed to do. Uh, you buy a Bible program and you put it in your program or you download it into your, pro, in your computer and it deposits a plan in your computer. It could be an accounting plan. It could be an engineering plan or a piloting plan. It doesn't matter what it is. It's been deposited into your computer. It's there. You know what? You are to get into it and open it up. Everything's there. Open it up. You, you and I are to do that very thing. We are to walk like you, like we do it. Because it's available. What are we talking about? Wow, look at verse 12 at the end. This is the statement, this is the verse that has divided churches throughout history. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How are we going to know what this, what this really means? Church, every time you do not know what a verse means, it's very, very simple as what to do about that. Does anyone, can anyone give me the, the answer to this question? What is the best commentary on the Bible that's available to you? Oh, class, you're beautiful. That's fantastic. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So, for someone in here right now who's never heard the Bible, never read the Bible, you don't know anything about it, today's your first day hearing spiritual matters, you say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, I should have stayed in bed. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, why'd I come? But if you know your Bibles, you say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I know what it doesn't mean because I've read enough Bible to know I cannot save myself. I know that God does not accept any works regarding salvation. I know that God says he loves me. So what's with the fear and trembling? You see, as you know more about the Lord, you have more answers to how this verse goes and you know how to unpack it. And then listen... We live in an amazing age where you don't have to buy $5,000, $10,000 worth of books to find out what this 
statement actually means in the original language. You can look it up for free now online. What is the original Greek words to these things? Well, number one, circle the word in the Greek. It's one word. In English, it's two. It's work out. It's the word work. The word work here means this. To take, listen carefully, to take out what you have been given. The word means to put forth every effort to bringing something out of which you already possess. Is everybody listening? This is critical. This is very, very critical. The word means to strive toward the bringing out of it. The word means to seek a finish line. The word means to get to the prize or to get to the point. It is an amazing word. Look at it carefully. Get to the point. Whatever is inside of you, bring it out. Look at your Bible. Bring it out, that which is in you. Regarding this salvation, it is the word soteriology or the study of salvation. The word means your salvation. You, your. Notice, Bible students, circle the word own. It's your own salvation. This is a huge statement. No one is going to heaven because their parents or their son is saved. No one goes to heaven on the merits of some other individual. This is what it means. It is your own salvation. I am called by God to dredge up, to bring forth something that has been given to me. Question, has it been given to you? To bring up something that has been given and to put it forth. Hmm. That's all I know so far about this verse. It's given, but it's to come out of me, personally. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Let's go to verse 9. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So listen, the lights are coming on a little bit. Hmm, okay, I'm starting to understand now more clearly. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Grace, salvation, gift of God. I can't work for it. That doesn't match with God's Bible, with God's word. So I now I lay that down. So what's happening here? I hate to bombard you with these uh, out backyard, outdoor uh, analogies, but it is what it is, and it's springtime, is it not? It's amazing. Check this out. The ground in my backyard is just sitting there. It's dirt. It's earth. I go to Lowe's, and I buy bags of bulbs. Bulbs. I just bought a bunch of gladiola, ranoculas, uh, various bulbs. Okay? By the way, they're horrible looking in the bag. If you, saw a, if you saw one of those things laying on the ground, you'd say, what is that thing? And you throw it away. But I know what it is, and the ground is just sitting there. I open up the earth, and I gift the earth the seed. Are you with me? The bulb. I put it in. What effort did the earth have in getting the seed implanted into it? Nothing. It received the seed, right? It received the seed and an explosion of life took place. And that thing is growing. And just now this week, and I noticed that some of them have broken the surface and they're about an inch and a half high. What's happening? Life. The longer I wait, the more the growth. Listen, is it starting to click with you? God's word gets into us. We just receive it. It begins to germinate. It, an amazing explosion of knowledge begins to take place. Things are happening, like in the seed. The seed is all the data inside the seed is amazing. Not the earth. It's the data. It's the DNA in the seed. And it explodes. And the word of God has a spiritual DNA, and it's inside of me, and it begins to explode within me when it's, when it's received. And growth begins to happen, and it begins to come out. And the longer I wait and stay abiding in the earth, the stronger the growth. And if I keep waiting, I'll get a flower on the top of my head. 
And depending upon what we've planted, it will continue, it will continue, and the flower will kind of wither, but there'll be like what's also in my backyard, little tiny, teeny, weeny, green bumps, little balls. What are they? Well, I know what they are because I know what's going on. They're oranges. And the orange continues to grow and grow and grow and grow and it grows so much that I'm going to eventually going to pluck it off and use it because it is fruit. All from a seed. God has given us that picture. The word of God gets inside of you. You grow, grow, grow. There's a flower. And listen, then there's, it looks like you're dying. It looks like something's wrong. Oh no, the flower is withering. Those are trials which bring forth fruit. And after you endure the trial, there is fruit, and the fruit grows and grows until the husbandman, the planter, the harvester comes by and, and looks at it and plucks it off. And that which once looked weird, smelled great, then went away, is now back, and it is fruitful. It is amazing. And that happens. That's happening to you right now. That's happening to us as we continue on with Jesus Christ. The Bible's very clear about that. Work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Next thing we understand regarding that is that this thought, you would think of a, a gold miner, as it were, concerning a Christian. How do I work out of me my salvation? The salvation that's in you, listen, don't hide it under a basket. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it. That's a, that's a cute song, but it's a biblical truth. There are no secret, covert, undercover Christians. The Holy Spirit DNA inside of you will not let that happen. No matter where you are in the world. You can be in the most atheistic, godless, communist North Korea, the most dangerous place on earth. You think Syria is bad? North Korea is ranked number one in danger for the Christian, North Korea. Why Why are people in prison and being tortured in North Korea? Why are Christians being tortured and in prison? Because the spiritual DNA in them has to grow. They ain't no keeping it down. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. Are you a Christian? Then look, it's springtime. You're about to explode. And if you don't, not quite sure what you are. If there is not the truth of God inside of you screaming to get out, if you're not feeling the explosion of angst inside of you, knowing I need to grow, I just know this is... How is it that some people come to this church and they'll tell me in the foyer, you know what, when I came here, the worship touched my heart and then the word of God spoke to me and I've never been here before, but I've found my home. Come on, let's be honest. We know what they're saying, but this is not their home. It's not my home. Why do they feel like that? Why are they honestly feeling that way? Because they've experienced God and God uses his word. And what he does is when he touches them, they start to explode. They start to grow. That thought of a miner mining until he reaches the gold is exactly the same thought for the believer. Work out your own salvation. You can't save yourself. Because you have salvation in you, let it out. That's why the title is what it is. It's time to go now. It's, time to, it's always time to go now for the Christian. Every day, every moment. Jesus said it this way. Matthew 24, 13. But he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. It doesn't mean if you hang in there and only then. Listen, denominations, I'm not going to name them. I don't want to get people freaking out. But I could tell you from that verse, people will say there are denominational leaders who will say, see, you can't know you're saved until the end. Jesus will tell you when it's all over if you're saved or not. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That verse is saying, Jesus is announcing You continue to grow and expand and blossom, and in the end, you'll see the salvation that has started in you is going to mature and and come to its fruiting at the very end. It doesn't mean, well, it's a white knuckler, hang in there, and only the tough ones are going to be saved. That's not what it means. He will see to it that you endure because his salvation is like that. It's all about sanctification, really. It's about God pulling you out of this world and preparing you for the next. And while he's doing that, he's using your example, your life, to bring other people with him, with you. It's pretty amazing. Notice this, you guys, in your Bible. It's not work for your salvation, is it? 
It's not work up your salvation. <laughs> just say you're saved. Go ahead, speak it, say it. Just say it, just say you're saved. Say it, say it, just say it again. Say it 10 times. Not work it up, not work for. It's not even work in. Now you just work that salvation in. You just rub it on there, get some salt and some butter and just rub it in there. People are so messed up today, you could make that a, you could make that a national teaching series. The Rub It In series. <laughs> Welcome to the Rub It In conference. You just rub your salvation in, you'll be saved. No, it's not. He's speaking to the beloved brethren and salvation. If you have it, it's got to come out. That's why when you see somebody, listen, this is, this is going to just cause you to be so happy. You'll see someone and you'll hear the Lord inside of you say, tell them, tell them I'm Jesus. Tell them I love them. And then the fun begins because we're like this. Oh, okay. Hey, excuse me. Or we go, mm, me? God, come on. And we look like totally normal people standing in line at the store somewhere, but then we, we're like, cool, cool, cool. We're, we're like, we're like. <laughs> right? And we get in an argument with God. All he wants to do is use us. All he wants to do is take what's inside of us and pull it out. He just wants that to come out of us. It's just better and faster and more fun just to obey him. It really is. We're running out of time. Not normal. <laughs> James chapter 2. You've got to go to Dr. James when things like this are being discussed. James chapter 2. James, the Bible, Bible tells us, the half-brother of Jesus, James. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith and does not have works? I have faith, someone says. And James says, oh, that's great, but you have no evidence. You have faith. Listen carefully. Can faith save him? Ooh. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Absolutely true. Do you have salvation in you? Yes. Then, listen, it will be evident by how you live your life. Look at verse 18. James chapter 2, verse 18 says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. James responds, Show me your faith without your works. It's impossible. And I will show you my faith by my works. You hear that? You want to talk about it? If you, all you can do is talk about it. James says, I don't have to say a word about it. I'm going to show you by my life that I believe in Jesus. It changes me. No, no, I believe in Jesus, and you have no evidence. Oh, I believe in God, and listen, there, all week long, there's no evidence that you even have any different life at all. You're just like the world. Oh, I know Jesus, and there's no difference. There's no change. And listen, here's, we won't get to it today. We'll have to get to it next week. It's this. The Christian has this well coming up of what's inside this soteria, salvation, and it engages the culture. It engages the family. It engages the individual you're talking with. It comes up and it comes out. I mean, I, I don't want to put it this way, but it's kind of graphic, but maybe it put the picture in your head. You can always tell what a baby just ate for dinner if the baby gets upset. You know what I'm saying? Oh, there's the corn and there's the beans over there. How do you know? It came out of them. Well, how do you know someone's a Christian? This came out of them. Does that get a picture in your mind? Need I go any further? You got that? James is saying, don't talk to me about it. I'll show you what you're talking about. Watch my life, James is saying. That's real Christianity. Wow. James goes on, though. He says, verse 19, James 2, 19, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. The word tremble is here is goose flesh. Is that funny? You ever seen, you ever seen turkey? Have you ever seen a naked turkey? It's got all the bumps on it. That's what that word means. The devils think about Jesus and they, their skin, <gasps> they freak. That's kind of neat, isn't it? it? Makes you want to walk around saying, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> right? Can you imagine these demons in the spirit realm? <clears throat> <clears throat> Satan, listen, he never has a good day. 
all around the world, even at the very least, people are praying for their meal all around the world. Thank you, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) Satan never has a good day. That's why he's in such a bad mood all the time. (laughs) Never has a good day. This is about maturing in Jesus. This workout is the believer's growth in his or her application to God's word in their life. It's about letting what's inside of you out. It's about the fact that what's inside of us is the knowledge that God has saved us from our sins. It's a very powerful truth. When he says to work out your own salvation, he says with fear, circle the word fear. It's interesting because the word fear is the word phobos. It has many applications in the Bible. Phobos can be good or bad. For example, uh, I have a a phobos, I have a phobos of snakes. I don't like snakes. Well, this is harmless. Keep it away from me. Uh, there is no such thing as a harmless snake to me. I don't even care if it's the size of a worm. I don't want to deal with it. There's something about it. Oh, well, oh, look, that's my phobos. You have yours. Here's the deal. When it says phobos, this fear, it, in the context, it is a, it is a, a godly Um, awe. It is, you know what it is? It's going to the edge. Have you been to the Grand Canyon? It's going to the edge of the Grand Canyon there in the South Rim, for example, and you stand there, and it's like, awesome. Do you know that feeling? Have you ever been there? We should take a field trip. (laughs) It's total, it's like going down to the beach, down to the wedge, when there's 20-foot waves, and the ground shakes, and you stand there, and you go, awesome. You feel so little. And the ground is shaking when the waves break. That's awesome. Phobos. It's a healthy fear. It's a good thing. The second thing is trembling. The word trembling is tromos. It means, listen, it means to quake. It means to shudder. Listen. It means to shudder over the fact that there's a day coming that we'll stand before God. We have an appointment with God. So let your salvation come out of your life knowing this. There's an awesome moment that will be realized in our lives when we stand before Almighty God. Only the believer can have this. This is not a terror to the unbeliever. This is only an application to the believer. When it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for time's sake, we're going to have to put this right here for now. At Christmas time, are you not given a gift? Do you not get a gift? You didn't buy it. It was given to you. This is us. Listen, the gift is given. Now you have to work out that gift. So what? The gift is all there. You have to unwrap it and let it out. It's the same thing regarding your salvation. Now, church, you can close your Bibles if you'd like, but I'd like you to meditate on this closing. If you want to close your eyes and let this sink in, maybe that's really good. What are we talking about? It's time to go now further on in your walk with God, and we think about this. William Barclay, in years gone by, gave this Great challenge for the man and for the woman who is working out their salvation with fear and trembling, seriously considering Christ and everything. He says this, there is the sign, the miraculous sign, and you judge yourself, friends, of actuation. The miracle of of actuation, it is this, watch, there is an almost violent determination in the believer, a total dedication to see God at work in one's life in a godly way. They are satisfied, yet they cannot be satisfied until they have more of God. There is the sign or the miracle of consecration. Those who are working out their own salvation with fear and trembling, they recognize that within themselves there is nothing good, not because of a martyr's complex, but because they have come to gaze upon the righteousness of God and His holiness. There is the sign, the miracle of serenity. 
They have come to the end of idle talk. No gossip anymore, no complaining like the children of Israel. They have found their rest in God. They have rejected that murmuring which destroyed Israel in the wilderness. They have come to trust in God as he has disarmed the situations of their life. I love that. There is the sign, the miracle of purity. They live with a deep sense of termination. That is, the road that they're traveling on is nearing its end. And when that time comes, that's when all this living will have its total meaning and its glorious conclusion that launches their beginning. This is a comforting thing. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that more than ever, we would be a people who leave this place today equipped with this truth. As a born-again Christian, the Holy Spirit living within me is not for display. It is not to be put on a shelf. It is not to be placed on the mantle. But Lord, your will is that we would be propelled out into the culture, heading back home now, to the job, to the community, to live vibrant, visceral lives for Almighty God. Lord, we pray, we make this request, Father, that you today would draw up and out of us the voice of the Holy Spirit, that when you speak, we would obey, that when you talk, we would act. And Lord, help me, start with me, to stop analyzing, to stop wondering, is that God or is that me? To take the risk to obey and to analyze later, to follow God in all that we do. Lord, we dedicate this church to you, not the building, its people. Lord, may we live, do all that you say. Thank you, Father. It's time to go now. And may we know that you're going with us. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say.